Welcome to the Web3 Vision podcast brought to you by ENS Vision. At ENS Vision, we are the leading ENS marketplace in Web3 and also one of its largest registrars. But with this podcast, we want to get out of our ENS echo chamber and look at Web3 as a whole. Because one of the characteristics of these times we are living in is that it is very easy to fall into the habit of communicating only within a very comfy echo chamber of people with very similar opinions and, let's be honest, very similar prejudices too. That's why, if for our first episode we had the creator of ENS Domains himself, for this second episode we wanted a 180 degree twist and have the project that has been seen by many of us as ENS's biggest foe, Unstoppable Domains. So we've had a frank and open conversation with its CEO to learn what he thinks about what we think. Also note that this conversation took place before the Unstoppable Domain patent controversy took place, and also before the announcement that Unstoppable Domains is going to be integrating ENS Domains. So after our chat, I reached out to Matt again for clarification. Reaching out via DM about the patent controversy would have been pointless though, because it is a complex topic that requires a whole conversation to deal with. But I did ask him if he could give me some more information about the ENS Domains announcement. And this is what he said. We are going to offer registrar services for .eth like we used to do five years ago. We will look for ways to add more functionality for ENS Domains into our current tools at Unstoppable. Expect the launch this summer. So could ENS's largest rival become ENS's largest registrar? Who knows? The one thing that is sure is that Matt has the necessary grit and persistence and also is very, very well funded. But anyway, it's time now. Let's start. Let's meet Matthew Gold. Let's meet the man behind Unstoppable Domains. Hello, everybody. Today we have with us Matthew Gold, the CEO of Unstoppable Domains. Matthew, hello. How are you? I'm doing well. Happy to be here. Great. Thank you so much for coming on one of our first podcasts. So the first thing I wanted to ask you, and it's something that I want to ask everybody that is going to come on this podcast, we want to know what does Web3 mean for you? Oh. I think a lot of people are asking themselves that right now, uh, given the huge correction we've seen in the market over the past uh, 12 months. And there's a lot of people in Web3 who are asking themselves, hey, what, what are we actually here for? What are we trying to build? Uh, and what value are we trying to provide uh, to the world? And for me, when I think about what we're building at Unstoppable, I always come back to some of the problems we have online. And those two big problems for me are, uh, you don't know if you're talking to a bot on the internet. So there's a lot of fake accounts and this creates a bad internet experience. Uh, and then you have a lot of fraud and scams and other type of activities online that make our internet experiences a lot more negative. And when we set out to build uh, Web3 domain systems, we thought that digital identity with Web3 domains could help us solve both those problems because you could have an easy to remember name and you can tie that back to all the different things that you do online, therefore giving yourself a reputation and letting people know that you're a real person. Uh, and then it would also increase the quality of your interactions and the data that you get online. Like you could tell if someone was a faker or a scammer and that could improve uh, the internet. So for us at Unstoppable, we're really interested in applying Web3 technology, specifically blockchains, and we're built on Zilliqa and Ethereum and Polygon to uh, try to solve these real world problems uh, that we have on the internet. Great. So can you tell us uh, to begin with a little bit about your origin story before Web3, all you did before you arrived in Web3? Yeah, so uh, I first heard about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency uh, back in 2013 when I moved to San Francisco to work at a startup that had recently gone through Y Combinator and they worked on marketing analytics. And so I was working there as a data analyst for them and I heard about this Bitcoin thing. And if you were in San Francisco back in 2013, 
uh, or tw yeah, the end of 2012, it was starting to be talked about a lot. And it was just one of those water cooler things where the events after work, there would usually be a crypto event. <laughs> there were a lot of early Bitcoin companies at the time that were starting to build in the space. Uh, and I thought, wow, this is potentially super interesting as a substitute for our current uh, finance system. So that's where I started my journey in crypto. And I would say that it was actually before Web3 really became a term by you know five years or so. And at the time it was mostly all finance uh, applications. And finance is really cool, not something that I'm particularly interested in building, right? So this is not really like my jam. Fast forward a few years, Sorry, before we go into the Web3 part of your life, the, the company that you were working at before Web3, I'm just curious, I looked at your LinkedIn and it was called Talkable, right? Can you tell us a little bit, very quickly, what you did there? Because I think that's very important then for Unstoppable Domains, because one of the things that people admire of Unstoppable Domains is the referral program. And I see that company has something to do with that, right? Yeah, so and Talkable, we built uh, software to help companies uh, get their loyalty programs and referral programs for their customers. And so there was a lot of data analytics into that, um, trying to identify you know, who of your customers is more likely to be an advocate for your brand and how can you activate those customers and give them discounts or deals in order to get them interested in uh, making a second purchase or telling your friend about your product. And uh, although interesting, it was uh, kind of a limited market. And one of the big problems we had there was that there wasn't a way to have um, portable uh, reputation between all these different e-commerce apps, right? And so <clears throat> you do all this work uh, to give customers um, discounts or deals or understand their networks or their likes and their dislikes. But there's no way for that customer to take that information from one of those applications to another application because you just lost all that data. And that was actually something else that I thought about that blockchains could solve. Because if instead of companies compiling and keeping all this data about the people who use their products, if the people themselves could keep, keep the data, and that way when they connect with their, uh, their apps, they could share their information, that that could actually kind of flip the model on its head and give people much more customized experiences. And the one that I thought about was actually shoes. I know that's kind of silly, but that was one of our larger clients was Tom Shoes at the time. And we would, you know, something as simple as shoe size, like knowing someone's shoe size would be super useful in order to help them, you know, find the right product for themselves. And there, and there wasn't a great way for people to like pre-populate that information or their, you know, mailing address for shipping and that kind of stuff, because there wasn't a form of consistent um, identity online. And then also fraud, fraud was another big problem. So uh, I think I, okay, I got so to that the like kind of inspired you to, to see more potential use cases in Web3, right? And, you know, I'm asking about this because one of the points of this podcast is to get out of our echo chamber of ENS domains. We've called it the Web3 Vision because it's not just about, even if we, ENS Vision, are a company that our focus is ENS, but we want to learn about the whole ecosystem because we think that blockchain domains are about the whole Web3, right? And that's why one thing in our community in ENS that everybody, of course, there are many things that they criticize, but there are some things also that they admire. And one of those things has always been the referral program. And even some people are saying, ah, we at ENS should do the same to have a good, strong referral program for YouTubers and influencers and people like that. So that's why I wanted to stress that because it's interesting to see that it's connected to your previous life uh, in Web2, right? Another thing that I wanted to ask you regarding San Francisco and all that, I'm curious because here in Europe, the world of Web3 is super location independent. I think Web3 and crypto is the most location independent sector in the world. And I'm curious if, are you still in San Francisco or, or you are in other area of the United States? Yeah, I, I think you're right. Crypto is very remote as a culture. Uh -huh. 
Uh, and I think it moved that way significantly. If you go back in time to 2013, that wasn't true. There were a couple of hubs back in 2013. It was Berlin. Um, it was Singapore. It was uh, San Francisco, for sure. And that's where most of the work was being done. <clears throat> and then there's been a great dispersion, right? And yes. and I think Vitalik also pushed a lot of that because he was actually coming from, uh, I think, Toronto in Canada, right? So, so you had these really great ideas pop up on the world from all over the map. And I think because crypto is inherently open and a lot of people can contribute from anywhere, that it evolved to be a much more remote culture. And I am no longer in San Francisco, uh, even though I had been there for a very long time. I actually moved uh, back to where I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia. Very and I've been here you, uh, to, with my wife in to, 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 to Yeah, work, exactly. To, yeah. to live, yes. Yeah, and you know, this is you know, we're a fully remote company, um, and people joke, you know, when you apply for a bank account, they're like, "Where do you? Where's your headquarters?" And we're like, "The metaverse." And the bank is like, "That's an unacceptable answer, right?" Uh, uh -huh. So, so you you know, you have to get a you have to get a physical address somewhere, and. Yeah. But that's just kind of how things are. And I think you're right that crypto is definitely much more remote than any other industry. Um, and I think yes. it'll stay that way just because of um, the idea that anyone can contribute from anywhere is kind of built into the system at this point. No, absolutely. And I think it's definitely the future. And in that regard, we are just uh, more advanced than other economic sectors. But I was just curious if still today in San Francisco, there was a, a little bit of a scene of web3 or not i think so actually i will say that mm -hmm. yeah and um i think that at least in the us i can speak to it more but new york and san francisco do have a bit of a scene that other cities in the us don't have for web3 and uh i think that's that's going to happen people are going to try to collect in a space where they can have a you know any advantage in the market to try to get a little bit ahead but i think the advantage is very small it used to be like if you yes. were in san francisco you were three to five years into the future right mm -hmm. and now i think because of everyone is remote and async you're three to five weeks in the future right so like the the advantage yeah. to being there has shrunk significantly as long as you're in the right channels on the right social network following the right people uh, you can stay up and uh, on the most recent developments in the space much easier than i think almost any other in industry definitely there are always disadvantages to everything but if you put them on a balance there is so many more advantages to remote working and we at ens vision for example we are also completely remote and i think it's like the case for the huge majority of web3 companies so it's it's really comfy, to be honest. Okay, so now let's move to domains, which is our favorite subject. So DID, Web3 username, blockchain domains, uh, NFT domains. What's the, the word now? What's your go-to word? Uh, well, I think Web3 domains is where the industry is going. And part of that is being pushed by the fact that a lot of the Web2 domain companies are starting to look at Web3 domain technology and looking to incorporate it. And so you have some naming systems are already interoperable with DNS and you can import your DNS domain into those systems. I think that Unstoppable is certainly looking to do that in the future. Uh, not exactly sure. We have a lot of tech to build, right? Uh, so I think Web3 domains is a, is where we are right now. Um, you know, the NFT domain uh, label, I think, has consumers a little scared because they just yes. saw the, the NFT bubble. So that has, that has subsided a bit. And before that, we just called them domains. And I think that eventually we'll just call them domains again. And I've said that a bunch of times. At some point, we're just going to call them all um domains, domains. And that, that's where i think yeah that's that's where i think the industry is going uh, it's just a matter of how quickly can we make it easy for people to use and uh -huh. uh, i think that's the biggest barrier to adoption right now and there's a lot of investment 
for companies to try to make that better. And in that regard, in one of the interviews of you that I've been listening to, you said something that I agree that it was Web2 domaining was mainly about names that were useful for small businesses and Web3 domaining is names that are useful as an identity. So mm -hmm. I agree. I think everybody who is in Web3 domains right now think the same, that right now at least they are about identity. At the same time, we all, all the time mention that we need to onboard more more brands. So I wanted to know, how do you pitch Web3 domains to brands if it's all about user self-owned identity? What's the your pitch for brands? Uh, so we work with several brands to actually help launch their own branded TLT. And we think that it's a really good way for brands to show consumers that they're uh, technology forward, and then also potentially build on some of this technology to offer benefits to the people who use their products. And that's mostly around being able to customize experiences based on their user profile. Like if you could see that someone was a very heavy DeFi user, maybe offer them a different uh, experience on your website or offer them rewards or things like that. So that's, what we're, that's where we're at with Web2 Brands. It's really early for Web2 companies still. Uh, and I think there's a lot of work to be done. There's some interesting things in the space that's happening. Uh, if your audience is not aware, Nike, um, I believe has a dot swoosh. So I actually mm -hmm. don't know if you have seen that, but they are on Polygon. Does. Yeah, they are on Polygon. And I think you should go check them out and give them some love because that's a Web2 brand that's trying to make a better consumer experience Uh, with Web3 domains um, on Polygon in this case. And Nike has always been a leader in uh, building new consumer experiences. They are one of the, you know, the way that they built their community around uh, running in athletics is actually really impressive. They're a huge company. And so they're one of the best uh, marketing brands on the entire planet. And so I think they're worth taking a look at. So as an example- And can you give me a, a very- quick summary of the idea behind that project because I've heard of it, but I don't know the details. So they have a great website that I would check out. And uh, from what I gather, they're trying to build a community, a, a digital community uh, around the um, their athletic brand. And that, that's, I mean, that's very web three is to build a community, right? And you have to think that there's a lot of people who really like running or really like tennis and they Would like to have a place for all those people to be able to connect with each other and share their experiences and and so you know that's that web 2.5 thing that people talk about where these traditional web 2 brands are trying to use web 3 technologies to improve consumer experiences and so i think you know that's a pretty good example and to your point web 3 domains really should be more about end users like people using it for sending and receiving cryptocurrency or saving data about themselves Um, as opposed to brands. I think that's where domains are going to land. I think that some brands are going to experiment with TLDs, which we're already seeing in the space. And then I think that uh, the long tail of brands will probably experiment with subdomains, maybe forming uh, coalitions for people who are interested in certain categories or industries, um, and then issuing those out to consumers. And, and I know that a lot of people are excited about subdomains this year. We'll see if that works. It's not proven yet, um, but you know we launched subdomains Late last year, we're on iteration two or three right now. We keep kind of pushing forward on those. Um, there's others that are coming out with uh, subdomains very shortly here. So we should see if that's going to be a way that brands can connect. So brands, I would say, are still unproven in the space. Uh, and I think that they're waiting on more consumer adoption. And consumers, I think, are waiting on easier to use Uh, Web3 experiences, because it's still just really hard to use your wallet and uh, interact with crypto and it feels scary. Um, so I think we're a couple of years off on kind of shaking out how it's going to work, but that's where I'm seeing the market right now. And in regards to Target, you are a good marketer, have very good experience in the world and have done a good job with marketing with Unstoppable Domains. What's your target right now in your mind when you think about onboarding or getting more people? people to use your product. There is some debate. Some people say we need to go for normies and some people say, no, we need to go for crypto people who use crypto and NFTs and still don't use a domain, a Web3 domain. What's your target? We're right in the middle. 
as a company. So you know, instead of looking for someone who you know, has MetaMask and uses crypto a couple times a week or something, um, we're looking for someone who maybe owns cryptocurrency, has owned cryptocurrency, has bought cryptocurrency on an exchange, something like that, uh, but hasn't quite taken the step into uh, self-custody of their keys, right? Um, so what we're finding is these are people who have who know about crypto, who have bought crypto at some point. Um, there's about 100 million people who fit into that category, mm -hmm. depending on how, you, you know, it's very hard to get metrics. Uh, but there's about 100 people who are 100 to 200 million people. So it's in the low hundreds of millions where they are, I would say, knowledgeable about crypto at least for one year. So that's actually a lot of people who have uh, known about it for a year in activating those people. So that's where we think we are in the cycle. It's not about getting net new, and that would be you know what people call normies, and we, those would be completely new consumers. Um, that's going to be harder because we haven't built enough of the middleware technology to make it easy enough. And we saw that every time you see someone lose their keys to their crypto or get scammed, but that's examples that we're not quite ready for those people. But that, there's still 100 million people there who were willing to take the first step in this last, last cycle, but didn't really activate. So thinking about how we can activate those people is where we spend a lot of time on product. Uh, and that is a lot of work. <laughs> Fortunately, yes. um, there's plenty to do and there's plenty to try. Uh, if I was going to name some things that will significantly help activate those crowds, I think uh, products like Wallet as a Service from Coinbase are very interesting to make it easier for apps to activate people like that. Um, I think our our product recently for parking uh, for Web3 domains is pretty interesting because and we're going to continue to improve that to make it easier for people who are particularly interested in Web3 domains who may want to try some Web3 things but don't want to take the full plunge yet. Uh, I think that there's some really great products coming out for security that do transaction simulation. I don't know if you've seen those, but a lot of people have that now. If they use their MetaMask and it lets you know if uh, you might be signing a bad transaction. Like it tells you in advance, like, oh, don't sign this. You're going to give away your board eight by accident. Um, that I think is very useful. Uh, you're seeing a lot of companies come out with uh, different types of notification protocols. Wallet Connect has a great notification protocol. Um, there's a lot of new messaging protocols. Uh, Lens has messaging, right? So these types of things I think will make user experiences better for those 100 to 200 million users who have already shown they're okay with crypto, but aren't activated. So that's where we're at. We're focusing on those uh, um, those crypto. Yeah, the uh, people who are in the system. centralized exchanges like Coinbase, they don't even maybe have self-owned wallets. It's like that right. middle ground, right? Yeah, that and I think if you, sense. I think that I think that's where the magic is going to be. And if you think about it, the people who are crypto native and using their MetaMask several times a week or whatever, and they, they do a lot of things with crypto, they don't need additional tools to be successful in Web3 because they're already successful, right? They're like, I just made $100,000 off my Arbitrum airdrop, right? And so like, they're totally fine. They don't need our help. And it's these people, it's these 100 million people who haven't made that step yet. And that's where the, I think the opportunity is for, um, for companies like Unstoppable Domains and protocols and innovation to happen to try to get those people activated. Um, and so, yeah, that's where I think we are in the cycle is going okay, from I'm going to early... steal that idea because I think it's a great idea. You have just worded it right now very well. I think that's the key. Now I totally see it. It's all those crypto bros don't need us, right? Because they are already like very familiar with crypto and they are legends and they know everything. And yeah, and they're very of course successful. They can, they can improve their lives, their, their Web3 lives with a domain, but it's not something that it's going to help them as much. But people who are much less knowledgeable and get more confused, the user friendliness of a domain for sending money and for interacting with dApps and seeing their name on the DAP and their profile picture and all that. So yes, I really love that approach. I think, it's very, I think it's very fundamental. And if you look back at history, it reminds me of when we moved from Bitcoin to Ethereum, like Ethereum had the concept of an account on your address and you could continue to reuse this thing. And that made it very different. It changed kind of how people could interact uh, with blockchain assets. And I think that domains have 
maybe a similar function to play for end users and that, you know, you can have one domain name and it can be linked to all your different crypto accounts. So it's that, that one layer of abstraction, I think will make it a lot easier for people to use. That's been the bet uh, since the beginning. On a slightly separate note, I wanted to ask you now in the past couple of, I would say months, especially it's when it has exploded, something has erupted in the technology world that is changing everything and it's artificial intelligence. Well, uh, it's absolutely, I think we are all like, we weren't expecting it to be here so early, right? Have you thought about the impact of artificial intelligence on Web3 and is it going to change our trade? Um, so yes, and I'm actually also, my mind is also blown away by just how fast the advances and specifically chat GPT have been. Yes. And uh, we've been playing around with it internally and I view it as a enabling uh, technology. So like, just like every company now is a tech company, it's like a joke in the US. It's like every company is a tech company because if you're not using technology, then you're going to go out of business. I think that in the future, every company is going to leverage some of the tools that you get from things like chat GPT to improve their experience. We've done a couple things already to play around with it. So we have a, a, a chat GPT domain name suggestion tool. So you can type in it. You say, I want a domain name that uh, would be good for a cooking show. And it will give you suggestions on our site. And that's using chat GPT, which is pretty cool. And then we also uh, have a, a profile picture generator, you know, an avatar generator. I've seen that. Yeah. Yeah, and we use and we use I think maybe stable diffusion. We use a couple different systems on that to generate those uh, photos as well. So I think it's really good for um, user art and specific. So I think the user art for identity is potentially useful because you may not want to put a real picture of yourself up on the internet, right? You, someone may try to take your fingerprints off the picture, right? We live in a world that is kind of crazy, but maybe you're totally comfortable having an avatar of yourself as your digital identity that goes around. So we're um, incorporating it there um, as well. And then as far as the rest of the implications, it's moving so fast, Matt, that I think we can't predict. So we're just going to have to stay up to date and see what happens. Um, and, you know, hopefully it doesn't become, you know, general AI and take over the world here in the next yeah, couple exactly. years. I think, we're I think on, the, the thing know? is that it's uh, the speed of it. It's absolutely... Yes, our little human brain is struggling to to absorb uh, the magnitude of the change and to to make decisions, strategic decisions in our companies, etc. Right. And one of the things that maybe I'm thinking maybe it's a bit worrisome is, for example, venture capital. Uh, for you guys, is fantastic. You just got a, a 65 million funding round a few months ago, right before the artificial intelligence explosion. We at ENS Vision have just gotten a very good round. But in general, for the space, I'm wondering, venture capital hates the vacuum, right? If there is a void, it fills it. It always needs something, an object. And Web2 was a bit boring, was entering diminishing returns. Everything was kind of invented. And then came Web3 and venture capital came to us. Now that they have found an even shinier, brighter thing to obsess and to uh, actually a shiny new object that is also super full of fundamentals because as much as I like Web3 because I work here and I see the fundamentals, the fundamentals of Web3 are a bit difficult to explain, but the fundamentals of artificial intelligence, you just need like one minute playing with ChatGPT or with DAL-E or Midjourney to uh, say, oh my God, this is absolutely gonna change the world so do you think there's gonna be like a flight of vc capital from now on uh, towards artificial intelligence well i think whenever there's something new and exciting then it's gonna act as a black hole for capital and, and sub capitalist direction while people try to figure out all the opportunities because it's always a gold rush for people to try to figure out what's going to be valuable and there's a lot of things to search and try in that field right now because it's so new that they need to do that. But I'll actually say long-term, if you look at some of the things that ChatGPT and these you know, stable diffusion and these other artificial intelligence models are doing is they're creating a lot of content 
and art, right? They're creating a lot of media, maybe even movies soon. Yes. And one of the problems you're going to have is going to be around value capture and attribution of media. And that's something that I think that Web3 is going to be very helpful, right? Because with Web3, you can prove provenance, like who created the art. Uh, and I think that people are still going to want to collect and own the originals of things or the official copy. And just imagine a future where the amount of media that's being created is essentially infinite, right? And even fake media, there was a fake images going around of, um, of the Trump uh, trial, I think on Twitter, which was pretty funny there that, well, it was, it was also a little scary. So scary and funny because there were fake images showing, you know, a former president, you know, not yeah, real was, right. was scary exactly. to, to watch definitely yeah definitely. exactly and but if you have uh, web3 or blockchain technology you can verify if that's a real if that's real right and so i actually think that in a world that's going to be saturated with content potentially saturated uh through these ai models because they can just create so much the importance of um being able to authenticate data is actually going to increase so You know, technology is typically, uh, you know, I don't see any kind of conflict with a strong growth in AI and a strong growth in Web3. And I actually think that whenever you have a strong growth in one new technology category, as long as it's not competing directly with the current one, it will help to show even more use cases for uh, that other technology stack. So I actually think that the AI technologies may help us develop some, you know, authentication type. Uh, technologies in Web3, more of those than we have today. And that's something that uh, is a potential opportunity that will come Definitely. up over the next couple of years. Yeah, I think actually that's one of the synergies that I totally see between Web3 and AI with all the deep fake videos. For example, at some point, maybe we won't pay attention to any video that doesn't come with a cryptographic signature that a human had made it and uh, that human is called Matt. Mm -hmm whatever. Exactly. Uh, so let's move to the tech block of our chat. Unstoppable domains, where do they live? They live on Ethereum, on Polygon, on even other blockchains? Yeah. So uh, we started on Zillica with the Zillica naming service, .zill. We then moved to Ethereum uh, and we had .crypto built on Ethereum. And then about two years ago, maybe 18 months, I have to check, we moved over to Polygon and we've updated our smart contract system. So three times so far in the past between those places. And uh, we have improved it as we've moved from system to system. And we're actively looking uh, with Polygon at our next potential system. Uh, and we're actually talking to them later today about, because we're always trying to find a way to increase the number of transactions that people can make either on chain or the amount of data that they can store off chain and how they can verify that back on chain and what's uh, best for the end user. There's actually, uh, you can see this on our Dune dashboard, I think on it, which is neat. And I think that we paid several million dollars in gas fees for uh, the Ethereum version right and then we moved over to polygon we moved to polygon and i think that we have issued more domains on polygon now than we did on ethereum and we've paid maybe a hundred thousand dollars in gas fees and that's something we do is we actually pay for the gas fees uh, for users because when we started the company five years ago we wanted to internalize that cost because if it's very hard for you as a user to update the whole system like there's no way for you to do that And so if we made a commitment at the system level to try to make gas fees important for the system, and I just told you it costs us $3 million uh, on Ethereum, then we're going to make the upgrade. So we made, and we made a, a move and an upgrade over to Polygon and that reduced gas fees by 99% or something like that. Uh, and we'll keep doing that as we go forward. Uh, when people ask me about, you know, what's the path for unstoppable domains, I always like to point to A16Z's blog post on uh, progressive decentralization, which is you know, over time improving the system, having a company steward that system over time to its end result. Um, and then at, once we get to a point where we feel like the system is robust at scale, then um, tightening in the controls on that 
uh, and uh, potentially enabling uh, even more direct community feedback for uh, system options. So that's what we've been doing. And if you wanna know where we are on that track, the system that we currently have on Polygon can support probably around 10 million simultaneous users, which sounds like a lot, but we know the internet has 3 billion users, right? Uh, and so we're gonna do at least one more major update to our system in the next couple of years uh, to try to get that number closer to a couple billion, right? Because we know the end result is going to be hopefully 6 billion people with or more, or 7 billion people or 8 billion people, it's hard to keep track, the world keeps growing, um, with a uh, Web3 domain and interacting online. So I think that we're still five years or potentially more away from uh, having a fully built in uh, at scale production digital identity system for the planet. Uh, but we've made significant progress over the past five years um, going from a system that could support maybe a few thousand people to uh, several million. So your idea is to base your operations mainly on Polygon from now on? Uh, well, we think Polygon is a great place to be. They have shown that they're doing a lot of innovation. Um, they have a lot of innovation around uh, roll-ups and uh, you know, specifically uh, ZK EVM scaling solutions, which we think are very interesting. We're open-minded though, you know, long-term. It's all about who builds the best technology. And we've had a wonderful time working with Polygon. We're actually the official naming service of Polygon. That was announced this past month, which we think is a, you know, it's a big deal. And uh, Polygon is one of the biggest uh, chains, biggest blockchains in the world. And you know, we really think that dot Polygon is going to be an important digital identifier uh, in the future. And we've actually seen a lot of people get excited about that, including the founders, you know, switching their names over uh, to, you know, uh, Sandy.Polygon and JD.Polygon. And, you know, we're excited to be seen as a responsible stakeholder in the ecosystems and really help these different services build uh, identity systems for their blockchains and make those things interoperable for everybody. Yeah, actually, that was going to be my, my next question precisely. Why Polygon instead of, for example, Arbitrum or Optimism? What made you choose Polygon? Uh, so honestly, we think that they are investing in the right places in the long run for being successful. And when you're picking a technology partner that's core to your business, you want somebody who's long-term invested with you. And that's nothing against these other ones as well. And I'll also point out that Polygon was up and running two years ago, right? Arbitrum just launched, right? Optimism launched in the last 12 months. So we made that decision two years ago, actually probably more than two years ago now. Uh, and I think it turned out to be a good one because they're still around now. They are making improvements uh, that, Polygon is going to launch its own version of rollups here pretty soon. They already have some out there as examples. And uh, we think that it's a, it's a pretty solid place to be um, long term. But again, you know, at Unsolvable Domains, it's all about the end users. And we think that all these systems are going to end up being interoperable in the future. We're not afraid to build on multiple blockchains. We've already built on three, right? And if we see demand on some of the roll-ups like Arbitrum, which may make sense. We'll take a look there too. Regarding your vision for the space, the conversation usually revolves around there's going to be a single name system, many name systems. I think you are of the many name systems camp from what I've heard from you on interviews and right now. So if we are going towards a many name systems model in which they are interoperable and coexistent, to what point do you think they are going to be interoperable? For example, do you see people from Bitcoin ever using unstoppable domains, which is built mainly on Polygon and Ethereum, or it will never happen and their dApps and services will never quite use unstoppable domains or ENS? Yeah. So I think that there will be interoperability and I think it's gonna happen at the middleware layer. And you're already seeing it with our uh, sign-in with Unstoppable product, our login with Unstoppable product, where we support um, multiple different naming services and signature keys across different blockchains. And when we talk to consumers, what they really care about is what's the key that they have in their wallet 
like do they have a bitcoin key do they have a solana key do they have an ethereum key do they have a you know whatever that key is and can they use that key to validate themselves on their naming service in a lot of different places and that is actually something that can happen through uh, standards and agreements at the uh, at the it's not the protocol layer but it's one layer up like the um, uh, the naming resolution service. So because people are going to be running services on top of these uh, naming networks in order to more easily do lookups. And so we think that's where it's going to be. Uh, one way to maybe think about it for Web3 and crypto people is kind of like the graph. Like they have a middle layer there where they have a bunch of, if you know about the graph, they have a bunch of nodes that read blockchain data and aggregate it. But at that layer in the system, you can have some aggregation across. So it won't matter if your naming system is on uh, Polygon or Ethereum or Zilliqa or Tezos or Solana, right? As long as those systems can agree on some standards for lookups and there are open source code and libraries for resolving them and our result resolution service is actually MIT licensed uh, as an example, uh, then I think that they can be um, interoperable. And so one of the big things we've done this past year was the Web3 Domain Alliance and we already have 50 plus members and that's exactly what we're working towards. So it's, uh, we have a lot of interest there. We have a lot of people um, who are interested in you know, coming to agreement on different standards for reading things across chain. And that's where we're gonna have those discussions there. And so that's the multi-chain thesis and you can see us building on the multi-chain thesis. We're committing to it. We're putting resources to it. Uh, we're trying to get everyone in the same room you know, we're interested in doing a uh, Web3 Domains conference where we can get everybody together at some point. So if people are interested, reach out and we can maybe get a group together and uh, have that somewhere where people can come and talk exactly about these types of issues uh, in the next year or two. And I think it'll be figured out because it's software uh, and it's super flexible and there's a lot of motivated people to find a solution. Uh, and for people who think there's only going to be one naming system I'll just point out there's 1,500 different TLDs and DNS, right? There's already dozens of TLDs and systems that exist in Web3. So the, the multi-chain or multi-naming system thesis is already true um, in Web3. And I think it's one of those things you can't put the genie back in the bottle. Recently, Brantley have given a podcast interview. It was very interesting to learn how ENS was in the past and how it is now. One of the things that he mentioned there was that originally ENS was very focused on decentralized websites and over time they shifted more towards identity. I wanted to know if you also think that decentralized websites are never going to quite take off or what do you think? Uh... Well, I would say that the thing that's interesting and new about Web3 domains is the identity component, because that's something that you couldn't do before. And if you look back, Unstoppable actually shifted a lot of its focus to identity um, over focusing on uh, decentralized websites about three years ago. And you can see that uh, through our marketing. And we actually launched the uh, Login with Unstoppable product um, over a year ago. So we actually led that charge. I'm glad to hear that um, people are starting to clue in to the idea that identity is the new thing, right? That's interesting and unique about Web3. And that's where most of the technology investment will happen uh, because that's the part that needs to be built. It doesn't exist right now. Uh, on the websites components, we actually see a lot of use for decentralized websites still. Really? So yeah, so I think it's not going away and uh, we are thinking about how we can expose that more for people to make it easier for them because there's a lot of issues about deploying your website on IPFS, which is not super easy. So uh, that is happening. And uh, so there's definitely people who are interested in, in doing that type of publishing. And the difference is, is that websites exist and you can launch a website on AWS pretty easily right now. And the tooling for launching a website on IPFS is a little bit more difficult and it's not exactly clear what all the advantages are in that space just yet. Whereas for identity, I think it's very clear that this is something you didn't have before. Uh, and that's why there's more resources that are focused Definitely. there. So yeah, I'm, that's a kind of a neutral, you know, kind of 
you know, pragmatic down the middle response there, but that's where I see it. So let's now move to the, well, this is the controversy block. And I think this is very interesting because we all in Web3, it's very easy to be in our own echo chamber and only hear other people reinforce our ideas. And uh, we sometimes can have prejudices about other projects. No, so this podcast is interested in uh, thinking out of the box and getting out of our echo chamber and see the other side of the story. No, so in the ENS community, we very often are very critical of unstoppable domains, and there are a series of things that people tend to say about unstoppable domains. I want to give you the mic to tell your side of the story to those people so that we know what you think about the kind of things that from ENS people say about Unstoppable. So I want to, to know your opinion and how you see things. So the yeah. first one that is the, I think it's the most common, is that Unstoppable Domains is not really decentralized, that it doesn't operate with that kind of decentralization uh, as other more decentralized naming systems. What do you think about that? I think that's an unfair characterization. And if you look, there's a lot of projects in the space that have companies that help advance their um, on-chain protocols. Um, and, you know, uh, there is, I think, a really good piece, which I referenced earlier, actually, um, which is, you know, progressive decentralization, how you become uh, more on chain over time. And this is something that we actively uh, have been working on at Assault Domains. The way that we see it is there's still a lot of improvements to be made. And if you need to make a lot of improvements fast, it's really good to have a interested party, in this case, you know, Assault Domains, the company, really working hard to make um, these domain name systems significantly better. So I think maybe the biggest disagreement actually just comes from our view of where we are in the market. And if you think that, hey, domain name systems for you know, Web3 domain name systems that have you know, a couple hundred thousand users and maybe just a couple million registrations is fine and that's enough. And we don't need, and like, it, it will just, what we have now is perfect, right? And we'll be able to grow over time, then, uh, you have a different view than myself. And I think that there's a lot of things that are wrong with the way that Web3 domain systems work currently. They're not nearly as scalable enough. I mean, we need a thousand X more scaling. We need to be going from a couple million domain names registered to several billion. Um, and that just means my much longer timeline means you want to have uh, a structure that allows you to uh, decentralize in stages, which is how... A16Z refers to it, but you want to, you know, progressive decentralization to get there over time in a way that is um, much more pragmatic. So I think maybe that's probably the biggest difference that we see is just how far we think we are from being successful as a industry right now and how much more work we have to do in order to make that happen. And I'll also point out that um, there is not a Web3 domain company in the entire space that doesn't have a corporate entity helping to push code. <laughs> you know, ENS has true names, LTD. Solana has bona fide. It has Those true names, by the way. Now it's called ENS Labs, but I, uh, true name for right. people who are listening to us and don't know what true names is, it's the mm -hmm. old name of ENS Labs. And that's a, that's a corporation or an LLC. Uh, and then there's also just a lot of governance things that are not figured out yet. And so that's a big uh, thing that we want to be cautious on. Because the thing is, if you make a governance mistake, it's much, 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 much harder to fix after the fact. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of people that went out and built DAOs. And you're seeing now that the DAOs can be a little slow to make decisions as opposed to a more centralized entity. And maybe that slows down progress in a way that's negative for the overall industry in the long run. And then there's all the things around uh, regulations, which is another area. And that's just a, as a US based company, um, we're a little, we're, we're US centric here. Uh, and that means that we, you know, the US is pretty 
uh, right now at least seems to be cracking down pretty hard on crypto. Right? So every time I open the news once a week, there is some U.S. regulator regulating something. And um, so we want to be more cautious on those things. So it's really about timeline and a level of caution. And I will point to our smart contracts themselves. And if you look at our smart contracts, uh, for instance, on Ethereum, when we moved over to Polygon, we locked the smart contracts and tore up, you know, so like that, that I mean, that is 100% on chain, everything for uh, the the dot crypto smart contracts on Ethereum L1. Um, and that's just the way that, that that is. And, you know, as we migrate our Polygon system to maybe a Polygon L2 or whatever we decide to do there, we will continue to uh, make our previous versions of ourselves lock them up and then the new versions hopefully make them better. And at some point in time, we'll be able to say, you know what, the protocol is mature and now is a good time for us to put in place um, different uh, mechanisms for uh, governance or updates or whatever, and then follow community standards for them. So yeah, I think really that argument um, is not that, I think it's, if you look at it, it's on a spectrum in the industry. Everybody in the industry has a corporate entity that's working for there. There's no difference there between these different products. Yes, but for example, and, one one thing uh, you say that you are in the United States are are quite uh, U.S. centric. Just to understand if, for example, the authorities come to you and say to you that domain needs to be removed because it belongs to somebody who. Uh, uh, we we want to attack for some reason, you have to do it, right? Uh, so we actually think that regulation is going to happen at the middleware layer, which we talked about. And so I've talked about this before. And we think that there's a future case where on-chain assets are owned by users and their private key, uh, like they are on our Ethereum smart contracts. And there's nothing that can be done about that case. But apps can decide whether or not they want to resolve those. And we think that that's kind of equivalent to what you're seeing now in the U.S. with uh, platforms like Twitter or Facebook. And they're trying to work around regulation. Like, is Twitter responsible for what someone posts on Twitter, right? And um, we're, we're figuring that out right now. But I think the answer is going to end up being no. Uh, but Twitter is responsible for enabling other people to be able to um, mute that content is what you're kind of seeing happen. And so I think that's the end result is that people will have more options for, uh, what they see and what they don't see online over time. Okay. And that's going to happen by the way, on any naming service, right? <laughs> because, because if it doesn't matter what's on chain, because it's going to be regulated at the application layer, then it really doesn't matter. Like if you have a fully locked system on chain, well, if the regulation is still happening at the application layer, then it doesn't matter which naming service you're using because that's where uh, you're going to see those types of arguments take place. So, yeah, I think it's... And, yes, we, and sorry, yes, tell me. Oh, no, I would just say, I think the jury's out on exactly how that's going to work, but that's how I think it's going to end up being. Okay, and uh, something slightly connected to this, it's the... Um, the dot coin uh, fiasco, if we can call the, it uh, like that. I know that you also guys weren't happy of that, uh, that that had to happen. So to understand your side of the story there, because people say that's the proof that unstoppable domains are stoppable, are ruggable. No, uh, you can rug these domains unlike other protocols. So what would you say to those people? Uh, well, uh, I think there's a lot to unpack there, but I will say that the people who own .coin domains still have them in their wallets. So, and what we put in place was a returns policy, so that people are able to turn those back in. And if you look back at Ethereum, you know Ethereum experienced a DAO fork pretty early in its existence, and they actually had to fork and then form ETC and ETH. Right. And if you go back and you look at a Vitalik and talking about protocols when they are early in their development, he just said, you know, there are certain situations where you have to look at the public good, especially early on with things, and then decide to do the right thing as best as you can. And then when you go forward, you try to commit to doing the best you can of never making that mistake again. And that's how I think about it on Unstoppable Domains. We had a TLD naming collision, and that's potentially very dangerous for users. I mean, imagine if Unstoppable had a uh, .eth 
TLD. Just imagine what would happen. People would definitely send crypto to the wrong person and that would hurt absolutely everybody. And we're never going to do that, right? And the reason is because people would get hurt and we didn't have a system for reconciliation inside the industry uh, prior to us having to do uh, this fork and this return mechanism for Dotcoin. Um, and that's why we built the Web3 Domain Alliance so that we can talk to others in the space. And as industry players, we need to be responsible together not in Web3 and then also between Web3 and Web2 um, to build in standards and uh, ways to reconcile these types of conflicts um, in order to try to push the whole industry forward. So we felt like if we didn't do it, then it was going to be very, very hard for Web3 domains to reach global legitimacy. And so that was a cost that we had to take in order to uh, try to build for the long term. And our view really is a 10 year view. And I think that we made the right decision and we're always going to get criticized for it. Just like Vitalik and Ethereum is always going to be criticized for the ETH hard fork for the DAO. And I'm okay with that because I have some pretty good examples of, you know, you just, you have to do the best that you think you can. And some people aren't going to like it. Uh, and I'll just point out that that was a case for us. And it's not, you know, we're committed on a going forward basis to do absolutely everything we can to prevent something like that happening again. And we have put resources behind it uh, and we're going to stick to it. And people are going to believe us because we prove it over the next five years. And that's fine. Uh, and I agree with them and they should watch and see if that's the case. And uh, but we're we're fully committed on that front. And regarding this, uh, something that you have mentioned is also another thing that some people say, no, this is not a good idea is the You said that you are trying to avoid name collision, but at the same time, you have many TLDs, dot .blockchain, dot .x, dot .crypto, many of those, and you continue creating new new ones. Do you think that um, people say that's going to be problematic, especially with Web2, because Web2 is also all the time creating new TLDs, and at some point they are going to maybe create dot .wallet, that is one of your TLDs, or dot, uh, .crypto, for example. Do you have a plan for that scenario? Are you thinking, I'm sure you are thinking about it. What's your take on that? Yeah, well, uh, I think that these things will have to be gotten to through social consensus. And I'll just say, you know, what would you think if someone launched another Ethereum tomorrow, right? Like, of course, you'd be like, well, no, you can't do that. Like, you can't use that name. You know, people would try to stop it. Uh, and I think that in the future, people are going to do the same thing with TLD collisions. And in fact, they already are. And we've had several cases where uh, we've talked to other projects, we've helped avoid collisions, and we're going to keep investing in um trying to build knowledge around this so that we can avoid them. And then with regards to our currently released TLDs, every time we launch a TLD, we do research on uh, what's out there and then try to ensure that we're in a place where we're not going to be um, creating a potential conflict with other people. And then if you look at our most recent launches, they've been focused on brands. And we think that brands have, like Polygon, for instance, I think they have a pretty good legitimate claim, at least socially, on consensus that dot .polygon is um, for their community of people, right? And so if we're working, and then, you know, blockchain.com has dot .blockchain, right? And so if we're working with apps to uh, launch TLDs that are consistent with their brand, we think that's a lot less conflict. So on a going forward basis, we really are trying to adhere to um, launching TLDs that match a community and or brand, as opposed to generics. Um, as a way to avoid, uh, you know, to give more time for the industry to come up with better ways of reconciling uh, namespace collisions. And that's where we're going to continue to focus. Um, Is that why you have gone for a polygon instead of for dot poly? Uh, that's a, that's pretty funny. Um, Yeah, that, that is exactly, I mean, that's, yeah, definitely one of the reasons behind that is we want to try to closely match uh, any new TLDs that we do to the specific uh, brand so that, um, you know, these things do function as brands. And we know that. And the easiest way to know that is it's been really good for Ethereum to have .eth, right? It really has helped push the narrative for the brand behind Ethereum to have that naming service. And we think the same thing is going to happen for .polygon with Polygon. 
And I think it can also happen with Web2 companies. And I'll go back to swoosh, dot swoosh for Nike as an example for Web2. And that's very experimental because, you know, they're at the forefront there. Uh, and yeah, we're going to try to stay over in those lanes, at least for the next couple of years, until there's a uh, more information about how best to avoid naming collisions. And we do think that's going to come out of these industry organizations. And that's how ICANN was formed for DNS, right? And so we're trying to build the same types of um, collision avoidance systems here in Web3. It's a little more complex because they are open ecosystems and people can do what they want. Uh, but end of day, I think people are going to, social consensus is going to be what's best for users um, and what's best for the industry. And that's what we're going to focus on. Okay, great. So now we can move to almost the final section, away from the controversy section. Thank you so much for uh, answering difficult questions. And actually, now it's your turn. Uh, I would like you to maybe constructive criticism, we can call it, about ENS. Do you have something from your side of the story or from an outsider person who is not in the ENS 24-7 community that you have to say about ENS? Yeah, any kind of... Uh, well, I think, you know. I think my only, my only uh, piece of constructive feedback would be that market competition is very good for the space and just imagine how much slower crypto adoption would be if you know ethereum had never been launched because everyone said no you can only use bitcoin right and and just imagine how many different things we wouldn't figure out if we didn't have lots of different people trying it in DeFi, for instance there are lots of different DeFi apps and they created all sorts of cool things that people have experimented there's not just one right and uh, and there's not just one blockchain, there are thousands, and there's not just one layer two, there are several. Uh, and I think the same should apply to naming services. There's, there's not going to be just one, hopefully, because then we're going to have more competition to make the industry move forward faster. Uh, and, you know, unstoppable domains, to our credit, we have done a lot of things that were the first to ever be done, right? And when we, you know, uh, one of the founding members of our team was the first person to work on a team to make uh, domains, Web3 domains, NFTs all the way back in 2018, right? That's a big, that's a big improvement to turn these things from ERC-20 tokens uh, with extra data into ERC-721s and with a wrapper. And uh, we were one of the, we were the first people to enable you to attach multiple different types of cryptocurrency addresses so you can receive Bitcoin and Litecoin and Dogecoin all back to your same name. And that, you know, this is a significant improvement for users. We were some of the first people, I, I won't say the first, but some of the first people to attach IPFS files uh, and do decentralized websites I actually do that very early. We were, we were some of the first people to attach Twitter and Telegram uh, verified social handles. Actually, I think we were the first to attach verified social handles. Um, you can actually look on chain and see those records for us to do that back to domains. Um, and yeah. all that innovation only happens because we have um, competition. So I think maximalism is potentially very dangerous. And I would also say that platforms in general, like the blockchains themselves, so the Ethereum blockchain, you know, the Bitcoin blockchain, the Polygon blockchain, it's very important to stay neutral about apps that are building on top of you. And because you need your platform to be neutral. So I think that sometimes these maximalists confuse an application with the protocol itself. And you should encourage people to build on top of your uh, blockchain platform. Uh, and you should want to have as many different types of those as possible. Uh, in order to get better user experiences. So that's that's my I would, my only piece of feedback is that it's actually good that Unstoppable is here, you know, uh, regardless of your long-term outlook on our projects versus other projects or whatever. The fact that we exist is going to help move things um, in the industry forward um, much faster. And I think that maximals in this space are holding us back. So, um, you know, if you have a wallet out there, and uh, you're not resolving multiple naming services, I think you should talk to us. And we hope to build a solution that we can resolve all of these things from one endpoint um, to make it easier for you. And that would help your users. Yeah, precisely regarding integrations, that's something that I can say myself. 
uh, about ENS, a little uh, constructive criticism, is that ever since Brandley was fired, very unfortunately, in my opinion, I think he hadn't done anything during his tenure uh, to be fired because his opinions had been expressed before he was working for ENS, not while he was working for ENS. So I think that was quite unfortunate. And he was like a force of nature. He was like a, a integrator extraordinaire and marketer, a more than marketer advocate. He was like a very strong advocate for the ENS protocol and working a lot with integrations and, well with everybody in the Web3 community to get ENS more and more integrated. Fortunately, ENS is very well supported, even if he's not here anymore. But we can feel that super intense effort to reach out to everybody in the Web3 community is not as strong now. So that's constructive criticism that I can make to our own community or the protocol around which our community revolves. And in that respect, I was listening to an interview of you and you mentioned that part of your team, and I like that, is working on, well, you mentioned two things, that there is two problems with integrations for all kinds of domains, not yours or ENS or in general, that there is two problems. One was exchanges and another is hardware wallets. And that part of your team was working on creating solutions there. And I wanted to know if you could explain us why there is that difficulty with exchanges, centralized exchanges and hardware wallets to, to integrate Web3 domains. Yeah. For, so for exchanges, it's all about custody. And um, what we found is most exchanges custody the assets for their users, and that makes it difficult for users to be able to self-update because they need to have a key or an operator or something so that they can interact with it. So we're actually um, working with a few right now and hope to have something out later this year uh, to share on how we think that might work on a going forward basis. And there's a tech solution for that that we're pushing that we hope will help. Uh, so that's what we think currently is the biggest problem. Uh, also exchanges, I would say is a secondary problem. They make a lot of money on exchange, right? <laughs> and so they're very focused on making sure that crypto exchange works. Like if you talk to any exchange, they're like, how can we increase the amount that people are trading? And that, so that's, so I would say that for them, user experience is not as high a priority as a DAF, for instance. And so that's been some hesitation there, but we hope that some technology around interacting with um, custody assets will help there for exchanges. So that's my insight there. And then hardware wallets is a completely different problem. And um, the issue there is they want to have an entirely separate, secure environment for processing transactions. They do not want to rely on anything that is off chain ever, right? That, that makes complete sense to me. They're supposed to be very focused on security. And there's technology there that needs to be built namely to make sure that they have the most up-to-date information about a domain name, right? And so the problem there is if you set up your domain name and you have a set of addresses, uh, the hardware wallet can index that and then it can keep that inside of its hardware so it can know what your address was. But if you change your address, then there needs to be some way for it to be able to know that the address has been changed. Or at least there has to be a way for it to know that the old address is no longer valid. And so that requires updates from the hardware vendors themselves, which their primary focus is on security of assets. They're not seeing the consumer demand yet for uh, making it easier to interact with these NFT domains. So I think that until we have more consumers using Web3 domains, so it's a chicken or the egg problem, that hardware wallets are not going to be as interested. And until there's more incentives for exchanges, for Web3 domains on how that might help incre increase their revenue, that's also going to be a problem. So I tell you what, if there were, instead of 500,000 people who owned an unstoppable domain or an ENS domain or something, there was 50 million, then I guarantee you that these applications mm -hmm. would, right, would make the updates. And so that's on us as an industry is to make it easier for people to get uh, domain names. And there's a lot of progress there. And I think subdomains are going to be a big theme this year. We'll see if those can onboard, you know, millions of people instead of just hundreds of thousands. And we're just going to keep taking swings on improving those. But that's my response for those two areas. 
Great. And you say that, well, not not now in the interview that I saw that you have some people uh, in-house uh, working on, by the way, how many engineers uh, and people you have, uh, I didn't ask you at the beginning, how many people are working now for Unstoppable in total? Yeah, we have, uh, we have right around, it's less than 80, we're right around 80. And then of that, about half of that is our engineering um, uh, engineering design and product organization a little more so than you that, have right? 40 engineers yeah well we That's also impressive. work across, we work across a lot of different chains right and we also ship a lot of end-to-end -end product so you, you know we are a naming system but we also build profiles and we also build uh, authentication with login you know so we we're full stack we're much closer to the apple model where we want to own the entire consumer experience uh, as opposed to the Android model where, you know, they just own one piece and then allow other people to build in there. So that's where we've been. Okay. And you have some people in-house working on facilitating, resolving, and uh, at least is what I understood. Yeah, we actually already have that uh, created. The, the issue now is that hardware wallets are, and exchanges are just not motivated to implement these technologies at this point in time. So I actually think the technical side is solved and okay. it's really just about uh, trying to get people to adopt. And that's always tougher to do in a bear market because everyone's very focused on revenue in the bottom line, which makes sense as opposed to new features. Um, and, and I think that that's just going to be something that eventually will get adopted. I think it is inevitable, uh, but right now I don't see a strong push. Yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, there is nothing like several millions of users to convince somebody that you have a case. Okay, so we have reached the end of our interview, Matt. Thank you so much for for being here, for having come here on the show. And yes, I think uh, that maybe we can disagree in some things, but one thing is sure, you are one of the most approachable CEOs in the Web3 space always uh, up for chatting with whoever asks uh, for your time. So yeah, really, uh, it's been very interesting, this chat and learning more about Unstoppable Domains and more about you. So yes, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, glad to be one of your first guests on your podcast. I wish you great success in all that you do. And for people out there uh, listening, I just want to say as Apple Domains, we love uh, the NFT Web3 domain space. We've been here for five years. We're going to keep pushing to help people build their Web3 identity, to log into your Web3 applications with your NFT domain, to make it easier for you to send cryptocurrency addresses, to create even decentralized websites, if that's your thing. Uh, and we'll be here for the next five years, just like we've been here for the previous five. And, you know, watch us build. I mean, we're, that's the best place where the rubber hits the road. Uh, we like to ship things. We like to test new things out. And uh, we're excited for everyone to get their Web3 domain um, as their identity, digital identity on the internet. And we really think it's going to help solve um, the problems that we have around fake accounts, around bad information online. And those problems are only going to get worse this decade. So the, the need for this solution is real and I want the whole industry to be successful and um, you know, it's up to us to build it. And you guys help do that too. Uh, the people who use these things, we love your feedback. Find us on discord or Twitter or wherever, <laughs> like Matias has said, we're very open. Uh, we'd love to hear it uh, negative or positive and we will do our best to continue building. Thank you. So uh, I hope that we will have more opportunities in the future. I'm sure that we will talk more because these protocols and these services, ENS, Unstoppable Domains, Web3 Domains touch so many aspects of uh, our Web3 life that yeah, we could talk for hours and still not cover everything. So, well, thank you so much again and take care. All right, you too. Thanks, Matt.